Two questions, please. The second is more important, and the first is a little bit technical. I once heard that the Jesuits are supposed to support the Pope, but they could never go for strive for the office themselves, and actually they could never be Pope themselves. How do you answer that? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, I have to say, the election of Pope Francis, the Jesuit, was first and foremost a shock for Jesuits because you're absolutely right. Um, it's something that doesn't enter into our imagination usually. Now, the technical part is this. When Jesuits take their final vows, they take a couple of minor vows. And one of them is that you will never seek higher office within, well, first of all, within the Society of Jesus, within our own order, and secondly, within the Church. And it dates back to uh, when St. Ignatius was writing the Constitutions. And um, often offices in the church, whether it was a bishopric or um, certainly if you were a cardinal, I mean, it came with lands and riches. And uh, he thought it posed a lot of spiritual dangers to, to his men. And so, but it's remained with us. It's never been abrogated. Uh, so we still take these vows. What happens in practice, though, is that, so you have these minor vows which ask us to uh, not seek higher off office anywhere in the church. But then we also have our special fourth vow of obedience to the Holy Father. <laughs> so, one trumps the other. Okay, thanks. The second question is, um, the Pope must have been in his early 30s, uh, in the 1970s, when the Jesuits were really politically active in South America, actually asking for political change. And I know the Holy Father at that time, um, they did not support that idea. So I was wondering if the Pope has, at this point, already mentioned anything. I personally also feel it's the change of heart that is the most important. Does he, to uh, does he totally um, not um, want to see any political activities, or is he a little bit um, supportive of it? I think, he's, I think he's always supportive of justice in any political context. But where he holds back, and this is, this is something that the church as a whole generally holds back from doing, is, is stating from the onset, is endorsing from the onset any particular political movement. And it, it's, it's a question of prudence because often one revolution ends up becoming the next dictatorship. Right? So what is the church's role in the world then becomes the main question. And, that, and the answer to that is is always speaking truth to power, okay? Comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable is, is one way of looking at that as well. Um, so in the 1970s, uh, Cardinal Bergot, or when he was, uh, he wasn't Cardinal, he was the Jesuit provincial of the Jesuit Argentinian province. Uh, that happened to be the time where the liberation theology was, was on its um, ascendancy and maybe also the time where it was experiencing um, some more explicitly Marxist uh, and revolutionary tendencies. And it was, it was those Marxist and revolutionary tendencies that he put the brakes on and said, uh, no, I, I, we don't endorse this. Um, Christian, if our Lord had anything to say in the Gospels, is that his, his Messiahship was not a political, earthly revolution to overthrow the oppressor, it was that his kingdom was not of this world. Nonetheless, um, you've probably heard the story of the two, there were two Jesuits in this province who had been arrested by the regime. And um, as their provincial, he had, he had gone to negotiate for their release from prison and, and they were released. And so, um, some, there was a story in the New York Times just a, within the last week, I think, saying that Pope Benedict was a, was a promoter of liberation theology. That's, that's, a, that's not quite accurate. Um, He's, uh, he, he, they say that he had a professor um, when he was in the seminary who was a big liberation theolo theologian. The, what, the person they're referring to is Father um, Scannone, um, who was a Jesuit who taught him actually languages and literature. Father Scannone was not a liberation theologian uh, really at all, but he had, uh, he, had, he had pioneered something called La Teologia del Pueblo, a theology of the people. And it's something that Bergoglio, Cardinal Bergoglio praised on many, many different occasions. 
And uh, it's a theology that takes quite seriously popular spirituality, popular piety, and um, of the ordinary people. And it's, it's alive and well in Argentina today. Um, it tends to be a movement that, uh, that um, believes that the most locally based solutions are the best solutions to questions of poverty and, and, uh, and so on. Um, it rejects calls for class struggle, you know, the kind of um, Sandinista type revolutionary activities. So, uh, actually, it was Scannone. Scannone's written things where he's, he's clarified his position. He said uh, his theology doesn't use Marxist methodology or for analyzing social reality. He's never used Marxist categories at all. So. Uh, and that, that clarification, to my mind, seems to mirror what the, um, precisely what the, uh, uh, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith said in the 80s about liberation theology. You know, that it, was, it had good, it was doing good things, but it, it was questionable when it fell into ideology. Thank you. What we heard this evening is actually nothing new. It was said by previous popes. So here we are having a new face. And we better don't build here a cult of personality. My, uh, my uh, question and comment is, he is definitely a different face. He might change to a certain degree a face of papacy. But will he really change the church? and where, what we, as people of God, can expect from the Pope. So far, there is no mention of Second Vatican Council. In my books, John, the Pope John, uh, John 20, uh, 23rd was the, is the only set of the modern era, as far as papacy go. So no mention of that. How, where will the Pope stand at that point? Will he stop the Inquisition? There is so many problems in Catholic Church in Vatican nowadays. We better be reminded that Jesus and Christ, Christ, uh, Jesus Christ didn't need actually any Vatican. He didn't need any churches. So we better build the Church of God, not the Church of Vatican. So we. Will all those people who were killed in South America due to uh, liberation theology, like Archbishop Romero, will he be honored together with the other smartest? How about the theologians, the famous theologians among those very many uh, Jesuits as well, will be, be, they, they will be, some of them even died without dignity. Where does he stand at that? Will he dignify those peoples and honor their teachings and let us honor those teachings and let us know, let us find out more about our beautiful religion? And so on and on and on. I could, I could list a number of Thank things. You. I wrote some of them. Where do I, I think that I think that he he's done a few things already that may may indicate so a certain un unblocking. Wait and see. Wait and see is is the only thing I can really say to that. But um, among other things, the cause for canonization of Archbishop Romero is moving forward. Oh, that's I'm glad to hear that. It's just about time. So. Every people of God, where do we stand? Well, you, we you, you stand in the people. aisle of this church, for example. Are we going to have any voice at all in all yes. that? Yes. Well, everyone here is the people of God. And, and uh, he's emphasized the role of every Christian to be an apostle in their lives. Right? And uh, yes, and I think time will tell. We'll, we'll show more indications of, um, of how how we are called, right? Because it begins, it begins with us. It begins with each individual to, to, um, to convert and live more radically 
the gospel call. Thank you. Rami. Father, about uh, 1977, I had the privilege of attending at the conference of major religious superiors in India. I was not a major superior, but uh, anyway, I was invited to uh, share about my experiences in the mountain provinces of the Philippines. Now, in that conference, the keynote speaker um, gave a very powerful message when he said that if the Catholic Church uh, will have any say in the future, the bishops, priests, and the, uh, leaders of the church must be willing to lay down the accumulations of the past. And by accumulations of the past, he meant the accumulation of power, of influence, of wealth and comfort. Because he said, unless we are able to lay this down, we will not be able to jump across the cliff where Christ is waiting for us to lead us to new horizons. And at that time, it was 1977, that was really also the, the time when, well, even now the world is still in turmoil. Um, but the, the message was so powerful for me that I never forgot it. Now it's more than 30 years and I have been really waiting for more changes in the church. And especially, uh, you know, the, the, in the leadership and even among the, the people. And I was very happy. I really uh, knelt down and thank the Lord for having uh, Pope Francis to speak about the concern for the poor for the first time after so many years I have been waiting for Pope to really give the, uh, to emphasize the preferential option for the poor. But then I am also thinking, will he be able to make any tent considering that the curia is not very ready for that. And even many of our bishops and cardinals are not ready for this laying down of the accumulations of the past. Thank you for your question. Uh, we mustn't be too hard on our bishops and cardinals. <laughs> <laughs> they, they work hard. Uh, there's no question that uh, one of the reasons that he was elected was to institute some reform of the curia, reform of the governance of the church. Um, and I think he's given indications already that he intends to, to do that, just in terms of um, the people he's appointed already to certain positions and so on. Um, but I, I, I would also take issue with, um, with what you said about uh, him being the first to talk about the poor and the preferential option of the poor. Um, the previous popes have talked, John Paul II talked about it constantly, and uh, Pope Benedict did as well. I just don't think it got reported on. I, I, as much. You know. People like Francis, and they like that he's like a St. Francis figure, and so they've kind of zeroed in on that. But, um, but yes, this, this teaching is with us, and it's a priority for the church, the preferential option of the poor. I think we're also seeing changes already in how uh, bishops and archbishops are... are conducting just the externals, like, because the externals uh, signify things to the world, and um, you know, I'm, I'm cognizant of um, Cardinal O'Malley in Boston, for example, they just, they sold off what had been the traditional Archbishop's Palace, of course it was bought by the Jesuits, <laughs> it's part of Boston College now, but uh, he sold that in, in, for the last, I don't know, 10 years, he's been living in um, just a small apartment beside the cathedral. Uh, Cardinal Bergoglio, of course, did the same in Buenos Aires, and, um, and so on. And that seems to be the wind that's, that's blowing into the church. We're in a different age now than in the past, when, when our religious leaders were, were also so, social leaders with a certain gravitas to their office, that kind of thing. I think we're moving into a time where the church is called to be much more 
prophetic in the world, much more um, poor and for the poor. Thank you. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, sir. Oh, I have like a question for you, Father. Uh, is it true that is it true that uh, President Clinton was a Jesuit trained? So, I think he went to Georgetown. I, I'm not right. sure that means he was Jesuit trained, though. No, that's right. Yeah. So we got the Castro, I think. Yeah. 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 Just want to clarify this true. Yeah, President Clinton went to Georgetown University. It's one of about 27. So with the that uh, or Daniel Washington, or Denzel Washington. I'm sorry. Denzel Washington was also a Jesuit trained. Who? The actor. Denzel. Oh, Denzel Washington. Washington. I don't know. I think in a different uh, university, which is uh, there's a much more Jesuit trained, uh, you know, program. Uh -huh. Yeah, like I said, there's about 27 universities in the United States that are, are owned by the Society of Jesus. Most, there's a ver varying levels of influence on these universities um, by the Jesuits because, uh, you know, they, they've, some of them have become very huge with, with big faculties and things like that. And, um, so, you know, you meet some people who went to a Jesuit university like Loyola or Seattle U, just south of us, or... Um, Gonzaga, and uh, you know, and may have had a may have had a certain formative uh, experience with the Jesuits who were there, or not. There's people who've gone to Jesuit universities and didn't even know they were Jesuit universities. <laughs> <laughs> Father, uh, recently I heard there are lots of conflicts between Vatican and some of the female religious uh, orders in the States. Have we heard anything about how the, our pet papa will be dealing with this? Uh, just what I read in the news, uh, which maybe you, you have as well, um, just that he received the findings of the commission that was uh, kind of investigating and meeting with this conference, um, and that it was, it's proceeding. So. Uh, I think some people hoped he would put, put the brakes on it, others that he would... Uh, I, I think he'll probably bring a different tone to it, but that he also sees um, you know, certain needs, certain uh, uh, needs that need to be addressed. You know? um, much depends on the manner in which these sorts of dialogues take place, right? Because like any organization or organi organism or organization, um, it's healthy, I think, at times to to have um, certain checks and balances and, and so on. But um, yeah, if it could be done in a collegial way, then yes. As people of hope, and uh, we do believe that the church yeah. will be guided by Christ, right? Absolutely, yeah. Pope is also the chief shepherd, though, and so he has a responsibility that, mm -hmm. um, for the health of the body in a certain way. No, I don't think he's. I don't think he's made any concrete uh, statements on that. My knowledge. Yes. So, John, um, my first question. I have to. Um, what about new evangelization? We know it's a priority of the church now. So, how does Pope Francis will talk about it, lead it? What will be his emphasis? How he wants us to make this new evangelization? Do you think? And second is about liturgy. Uh, a lot of young people were very attached to Pope Benedict's love for liturgy, and they were a little bit shaken when they saw that Pope Francis didn't seem to care so much as uh, Pope Benedict. So, how should we react about that? Yeah, first question. I, I think everything you said has been about new evangelization, right? Um, that uh, he's just he's just showing us how to do it. That we do it joyfully. That we do it humbly that we keep it Christ-focused, and, and so on. Um, he, he's continuing some of the novel media initiatives that began under Benedict XVI. I mean, I like his tweets, I have to say. I mean, they're, they're these bite-sized chunks of teaching and non-encouragement and wisdom. Um, so, but I don't, think he's, I don't think he's laid out a platform for the church and saying yet, and said, this is, this is how we're going to do the new evangelization. I think uh, he wants, you know, some of the other questioners have talked about this, 
I think he's leaving a lot of it up to the Holy Spirit acting, the grassroots acting amongst the faithful who above all can find the creative ways to bring the message of Christ into the marketplace. Um, secondly, the liturgy. Yeah. Um, for Benedict, it was certainly a priority. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, if our liturgy is our highest form of praise, you know, where the divine and the human meet, you know, right, right here on this, this very altar, um, that how we do liturgy is, is, is very important. Um, I haven't seen anything with Pope Francis that might indicate he doesn't, you know, a care for liturgy. Um, he's, he's certainly brings a uh, maybe a more familiar or common touch to the liturgies he's doing. Um, but uh, I'm, I mean, I'm not concerned in one way or the other. I don't think that he's going to either um, put limits on things that were done under Pope Benedict, nor uh, nor will he become, you know. Yeah, you know what? I don't really have a good answer to that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm reaching, but I, I, I think as time goes on, we will see more and more how Pope Benedict does liturgy himself, and that will, as sort of the DR teacher, he will kind of show us a way to do it. I think it's the way it is. Because we just get used to it. We're, we're just getting used to what Wayne method. Spark and running, I cannot be quick enough. And then we're going to make that. I am uh, a graduate of uh, uh, Jesuit, uh, college, three colleges in the Philippines run by Jesuits. And I don't find anything unusual about them, but they are great educators. Um, after Pope Francis, was elected to Vancouver uh, something of how to change How do you make of this um, report that the cases do not always show the Vatican line or uh, they are the most radical among the Catholic people? Yeah. Well, that was Douglas Todd's article uh, for the Vancouver Sun. Yeah. And, and, I mean, he has a certain optic that he's going to highlight of the Jesuits. Um, from my point of view, uh, our order is very huge. There's, there's about 16,000 Jesuits um, in, in provinces all over the world. And uh, like I said earlier, you're going to find Jesuits taking many different positions on different, different issues. Um, but the common denominator is that St. Ignatius asks that we have a particular vow of obedience to the Holy Father uh, for missions in particular. That if, if the Pope wanted us to go do a particular thing, we would go. And, um, and that's happened. It happened under Pope Benedict, even. It happened... Uh, many of the schools were asked to, to go and teach at. Is, is, um, one example of that was is the Orientalum. It's, it's one of the pontifical universities run by the Society of Jesus in Rome with a special focus on preparing missionaries for Eastern Europe and Asia. Um, and that was a specific request from the Holy Father, and, and so Jesuits went. Yeah. So, I mean, our charism is, is that we have a special bond with the um, successor of St. Peter. How that's lived out by each individual Jesuit is up to their conscience, of course, but, uh, but that is the charism that we are asked to live. the next question. Hi. I just want to say that I think that from everything that I've heard since he's become a Pope, that he's going to be very good for the young people, and that's where the church is, for the young people. And I think we have to be more positive. He just became the Pope. And I personally am looking forward to the audience. I'm going to attend the room on June the 18th. Good. Yes. I... Well, I'm very positive about this whole pontificate, but I, I think that um, World Youth Day in Rio this summer will be his first World Youth Day, and that will be a, it'll be a bit of a test, a, a proving ground for him and for the youth as well. So, looking forward to seeing how that goes. <coughs> Who 
who has the next question, the next challenge? Well, I'm not supposed to ask questions, but I have to ask. I'm so challenged that I have to ask a question this time. So there is a profound meaning of being poor and a theological meaning of being poor. And there are not synonyms, they are very different. I saw very people who had a lot of money, but they lived hopeless and broken and depressed, and they were really suffering of a meaningless life. And I felt those are good people. And I met also people who had no money, but they were full of optimism and hope and trust and confidence and power and whatever. And I felt I envy on them. They are not poor people. So who are the poor people in reality? This is my question. Who should they really help? Thanks, Paul. It's a very good question. Well, yes, uh, I agree with your, your fundamental premise that poverty is not just material poverty. It, Mother Teresa said at her, at her address to Harvard University, she shocked them, saying, do not call my country poor. Do not call India poor. We are not poor. You're poor. You're materially rich, but you're spiritually poor. Amen. And so I think we have to take that into account. There may not be a lot of material, materially poor people in the part of the world where we live, but having the compassionate eye of Jesus, I think, means looking to see where everyone's poverty lies. Every, every, every person in the earth has a certain impoverishment. Um, Catherine Doherty, the, the founder of Madonna House, her big thing was that there was a, there was a poverty of listening in our world. People don't listen to one another. And so her, her charism was, and especially the poor, she felt the material poor were the least listened to, but, but she, meant it, she meant it universally as well. And so she founded listening centers, right, where their, their members, they have the apostolate of the cup of tea. People come in and talk. And I think that's a very beautiful first world way of meeting a, a, a deep spiritual poverty, deep spiritual anguish that a lot of people have. Perhaps all that's distinct from the kind of poverty we're asked to embrace, right? A more positive side of, of what poverty is. And that's our imitation of Christ the poor, right? Christ, Christ who is poor himself. And that, that side of, that notion is linked more to what we call the kenotic side of Christ, the, the kenosis, right? That, that he came and that God emptied himself and took the form of a slave, right? This is from St. Paul. To the, to the Corinthians, that uh, and he he saw it nothing. He saw equality with God, nothing to be grasped at. But took the form of a slave and was and, and he died, died, died on a cross. So uh, you know, poverty in many ways is also emptying ourselves so that we can be filled by God. I think that's that's the basis of the spiritual life. The spiritual life is about lowering our defenses, get ridding, of our, get ridding ourselves of our attachments, letting ourselves become like Mary, who's the icon for us. She's the archetype and model of the Christian life, of following Christ, because she's the one who says, Behold, I'm the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me. So she's, she's carved out a space inside of herself, herself for God to act. That's, that's a kind of poverty. Uh, that's a blessed poverty. And it's also the foundation of the Beatitudes as well, you know, blessed are the poor of heart, blessed are the poor in spirit. But anyway, can go on and on. But that, that, that is in some ways the essence of Christian conversion and Christian vocation. Um, so yes, we distinguish that though from conditions of, um, of the poverty that is um, destructive in people's lives. And that sort of poverty is the poverty that we work to, to remedy bring about justice through love. Thank you. Then should I run now? I just wanted to share a little joy. <laughs> just a little one. Okay. Okay. You can make it big. You can supersize it. Yes, I wanted to say that I had the privilege of being in Argentina when Pope Francis was elected. And uh, when I left here to go on vacation, it was, as you alluded to, there was a very a cloud hanging over us, I think, or anyone in the church. We were very sad about what was happening, and how the media was reporting things, I was anyway. 
Uh, I, when I got to Argentina a few days after I arrived, Pope Francis was elected. I felt like I wanted to burst out of my skin. Horns were tooting all over the city, people were smiling. It, it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. At breakfast the next day, I spoke with the we had a breakfast served, of course, and people pouring coffee for us and spoiling us, etc. And the staff quoted, I'll never forget, this is a city of 10 million people. We know him. He walks in the streets and he serves the poor. I thought, amazing, 10 million people. I went to the Mass at the cathedral um, the day of his inauguration. I was so emotional, of course, I cried. This church was full, full of young people, full of old people. Um, the joy was just, just spectacular. And I saw in him, and I saw in the people of Argentina, how they smiled, how they embraced each other, how they kissed each other. And we saw the warmth um, on the media the day and when he greeted people at the Vatican, he shook hands, he smiled, he embraced people. And then I thought of Pope Benedict, who had a totally different, came from a different culture, a different, had a, such a warmth, but in a different way. You know, when one comes from the Northern Hemisphere, one doesn't embrace as much, one doesn't, it's just not done. I come from the Northern Hemisphere, we don't hug and kiss as much. Anyway, it was all very beautiful for me, and... Um, that's my joy. <laughs> Happy. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I marvel at how the Holy Spirit works in the church. You know, like I, I think we get the popes that we need. You know, well, certainly in the last century, we've, we've been blessed by a great many saintly popes who Amen. have brought their prof their own version of prophetic messaging to the church, um, addressing the major need of the time. And. Uh, yeah, when Pope Francis was elected, we were in the middle of a uh, conference at Corpus Christi College, where, where I teach here in Vancouver. And so we had over a hundred young people who were actually gathered in our cafe, where we have a big screen TV, and we were trying to get the image of St. Of, um, Peter's Square. And yeah, there was, a, there was a sense, the joy that I think the people in the square were feeling, even before they knew who it was, uh, was also palpable in, in Corpus Christi College. And that's the second time that's happened to me. When Pope Benedict was elected in 2005, um, I was in, um, I was also in a school that, that I was teaching in, and all, all the kids were gathered around the monitor, and uh, Abemus Paptum, and everyone erupted into joy. And so I, I think these are key moments of the Holy Spirit, just our awareness of how the Holy Spirit acts in the life of the church. Um, and, uh, and you're right, I mean, every, every pope is also a person and a personality and represents a cultural, cultural background. And of course, with John Paul II, we had the first Slavic pope, and he brought a very Slavic sensibility, and, and he, had a very, um, uh, he had a great deal of strength, especially of resistance to oppression. And uh, with Benedict, we had uh, very much a, a scholar, a Northern European scholar. All, these, all of these popes, though, I think, though, those... Those who knew them loved them. I think with Francis, we have a man who radiates uh, a, a personal quality, though, that lends itself to, to, to affection. And hopefully it's not just a honeymoon. Hopefully it's, it's uh, <laughs> something that will, will have some enduring, enduring quality. But we have to remember, too, that it's, it's, uh, our popularity with the world is not, is not our vocation as Christians, right? Our Lord is very clear on that point. But... Nonetheless, we, we should enjoy it when, he's, when our, our, our leaders are, are those who are also popular with, with the world. So. Do we need a carbon copy of Mother Teresa? Speaking for all the people who the second and the resistance to Russia, I have a question. Uh, Pope Francis received an open letter uh, sent by the members of the Fatima Center requesting requesting that the uh, Russian would be consecrated to our lady. And I just wanted to ask if this is something that is important uh, for the present Pope. I don't know if, so the question is whether the um, consecration of Russia is important yeah. to the present Pope. Um, yeah, I, I, I've never heard him make a statement on that one way or, one way or another. Thank you, Prince. 
does he approve of magic glory? Yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, he does. He's a great devotion to Our Lady. But, uh, so do all the judgments. Father, you mentioned um, attachment to well-being. Yeah. I'd like to ask you further comments on that, that idea with perhaps a couple of thoughts on uh, legitimate attachment, legitimate well-being concerns for well-being versus uh, uh, inordinate attachment and, and how to identify the line in between. Right. My interpretation of what, what Pope Francis meant um, at that Monday homily about personal riches and not being attached to our well-being was it's more of a question of priority and focus. That in the Gospel, when our concerns are the concerns of others, that is our well-being. But if our primary concern is our well-being, we will not only not have concerns for others, we will not be well. So I think he's just pointing out that we have a fundamental vocation to selflessness, altruism, to, um, you know, we gain our lives by losing our lives. Um, and he's, he's juxtaposing that mandate with what the culture often tells us, and that is that, um, you know, we, sh we should always be... Um, cosmetically grooming ourselves to be better people. Okay, well, I mean, that's true to a sense, right? That we, should, we are called to be better people. But um, how do we become better, better people? And, um, and that's a question of personal discernment in many ways, too. So it's about being faithful to the vocation that we're given. Everyone has a place in the church. Everyone has a state of life that is a path for sanctification that that should give definition to, to the way, the practical, concrete way that I pursue my, um, I won't say well-being, but the way that we can pursue our, uh, our sanctification. Uh, the, the great paradox, of course, every spirituality within the church says this, that if, if we're pursuing our sanctification, we're not becoming holy. <laughs> that in a sense, we have to forget ourselves. But, uh, but the, um, yeah, as the Pope says, there's no power, power but service. It's, it's a paradox, and it's a radical thing to say. But, um, you know, the more we can, I think, embrace that, that truth, uh, the more well we will become, the more healthy we will be. Sin, of course, is a great, you know, it, it's the great destroyer. It's what makes us unhealthy in almost every respect, spiritually, emotionally, and even physically, you know. So I think um, the more we just pursue the things of God in our lives, the more we'll be living um, in the fullness of life that the Gospel of John quotes Jesus as saying he came to give us. Right? Came, that they might have life and have it to the fullest, John 10.10. 10. Um, but then he goes on to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> so Christ-focused. As long as we're Christ-focused, we will be, um, our wounds will heal, and our um, growth uh, will take place. So. I agree with that. Sorry. I agree with that. I, I, I was there. I didn't even <coughs> enjoy it. I got sick. And then I got pretty with where I am now. My health is improved. And, and, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you for the farm, Father. And uh, my prayer and my hope is that uh, with these changes, that the seniors, the grandmothers, grandfathers will not be forgotten. And I underline this because I lived at Vatican II for the past 50 years. We had to um, accept and live all the changes of Vatican II. Now, 50 years later, we're again being asked to again face changes for the better hopefully now where do the seniors stand we have children grandchildren and some of us great-grandchildren we have a great deal of influence and everything that i see so far 
is that there's a great emphasis on the young to set up co uh, committees and so forth, and that's absolutely wonderful. But let's not forget our seniors, because we do have a lot of influence. We have, again, we had to live the past 50 years with really no direct direction. We had to, it was a one-way direction, one-way education, in the sense that we came to church, and at the homily we were told to do this, that, and the other thing, but we were never given the opportunity or seldom to have forums like this where we could ask questions of professionals like yourself who could give answers or direction. So my prayer is that we will have more of this so that people can stand up and say why this and why that and how do we do this and how do we do that. And I think if we would have had more of that, we wouldn't have lost all the people that we've had in the past 50 years. Thank you, Alvia. So, thank you for that. Thanks for your, for your comments. I, I think it's, um, that's not my phone. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the reasons why a lot of why people leave the church are, are varied and complex, but um, yeah, we, we're broken vessels too, you know, and, and uh, the church's strength is also paradoxically sometimes its weakness, so. St. Paul says, my power is made perfect in weakness, so I, I'd be careful about too many recriminations against the last 50 years or the last 100 years or 2,000 years, you know, we're, we, we as the church go forward with a great deal of imperfection. Maybe that's the Holy Father who wants to say something. <laughs> <laughs> We can ask him what he thinks about Russia. Um, but seniors, yes, I, 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 I've always thought, this is just, I'm not speaking on behalf of Pope Francis, this is just my own thoughts, but, you, you know, here in the West we have an aging population. There's a demographic shift coming that will be dramatic, and it's already happening in many countries in Western Europe, and it's, it'll start to spread here. And um, it's offset just a little bit by immigration, but um, frankly, everyone knows, and it's, and it's very critical in, in other parts of the world, what will be the pressures on seniors, on the aged members of our population? You know, we have the, the baby boom generation is now becoming, if I may, the kind of the senior generation. And uh, it, I speculate, but I think it may fall to the church to find new ways of providing for, for their needs, um, especially uh, if the culture becomes more and more hostile to um, the respect for life to natural death. Right? There's going to be pressures on seniors too. And, and it'll be sugar-coated and sold in, in very appealing ways about um, not wanting to be a burden on society and, wanting to, and want, not wanting to have suffering. The Christian position is very different. It's, it says life is valuable even when it's sick even when it's old. And we have much to learn. Jean Vanier teaches that about, about those with, with mental disabilities. Um, Physical too. And, and uh, yeah, in almost every respect. So, uh, yeah, I wonder if in the years to come, um, and there's all, I know of at least one religious, it's a new religious order, and they're, they're attracting a lot of young vocations, and their charism, their ministry, and it doesn't sound very glamorous, but, but because they can see Christ in the, in the faces and in the bodies of everyone they work with, their charism is literally to take care of the aged, and they run, they run care facilities um, in Ontario. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I just wonder if that may be an area where we have to also do more work in the future. Next question. When we are at the point at the subject of age, age, according to the Irish priest and scientist Darwin Omunchu, by the year 2016, the majority of the, of the population on Earth will be over 60 years old. So those are the facts. 
scientifically proven. So it has to be rooted in reality. It's, so the burden is actually on the shoulders of our shoulders of the senior people. So we better be prepared. Of course, we cherish our young people, but they will be minority actually after the year 2016. So it's good to be rooted in reality. Thank you for that. And sign, sign. I think the gentleman here in the front. Let's get serious a little bit. Uh, with regards to the, uh, I know the district is supposed to, the way I understand it is to extend the, the mind of the human person about knowledge. That's why you are one of the uh, front runner in giving good education to the Catholic uh, you know, students. And I remember our national hero, Sir Sal in the Philippines. He was a Jesuit trainer. But he didn't back down, just like during the uh, 70s in, in South America during the theological liberation, he was killed by the Spanish in uh, late 1800 for protecting the right of the human being against the government. And you know, you know the story of Pesar, he's one of the, the world-trained Jesuit heroes. Uh, I would consider uh, a national hero, supposedly made to my, and he was a doctor too. And regarding the technology that we have now, what is the standard of uh, Pope Francis regarding explaining how we can move forward? Like, for example, I read this guy, his name is Edward Oiden. He is a professor in MIT and another professor on genetic and he's a mathematician and he say just like what Einstein said in said you that true science is explaining the existence of God which besides I think is in our brain because there's about 87 neurons according to this guy you can read it on the internet that this will solve the problem about disease and it can prolong the life of human beings. And I haven't heard anything from my own church. You have to learn more because the tools is here. 87 neurons, and this example is the eyes is connected to the neuron, even if you're blind, by putting a chip that can see this time when I do my communion, I always do but I look at the chalice where the blood of Christ is in there. And my eyes is to my window to my belly. And I just made the research on my own. Maybe it sounds, you know, uh, different. But this guy is saying, that's where we're going, that's where you can see the true location of God. And I remember during the time of Galileo, he was stopped by the church. You have to, you know, I want to hear from the Pope, you don't really have to afraid, afraid to explore the knowledge that you think there is in the universe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the last, the last three popes have been particularly outspoken about the need for faith and science to be in dialogue. Okay. Uh, very much so. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think today is particularly critical because there's all these new developments in neuroscience, right? Yeah, we're learning every day. We're learning more about the, the the plasticity of the brain and how what we do affects who we are. So yeah, I, I would like to see more of that reflection going into um, church statements, uh, especially, I mean, I teach communications and media at the college, and one of my concerns, and, and it's, it's not just mine, but I, I think it's, you're starting to see it in the literature, is what are the effects of this immersion in artificial environments on the consciousness of the human person, on the, near, on the neurons, right? Because all we have are these senses, that's how we engage reality, and, um, you know, if, uh, 
How we view reality is determined by how we, by what we contemplate. Plato said that we become what we contemplate. Um, Saint Paul emphasized the importance of what we look look upon. Look upon the things that are true, that are noble, that are Historic. beautiful. Yeah. So our reflection, I think, as a church, uh, and, and how we engage technology today, has to take into account um, primarily what is the difference between the real and the virtual. And that may be why both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis have emphasized re a recovery of the sense of silence in our lives. One of the last World Communications Day statements that Pope Benedict made was called Word in Silence, in which he advocated that we have to have an ecology uh, in, our, in, in a world that's now saturated with words and visual, digital visual stimuli. Yes. To have balance, we need to have an environment of... Um, well, he called it like a kind of an ecology of word, image, and silence. For, for genuine communication to take place, you need that. Otherwise, you arrive at, at, at noise, which is the opposite of communication. Okay. Thanks for your questions. questions. The last opportunity. Uh, Michelle, did you have a question? All right. Um, <clears throat> what is your hope when you look at the pontificate of Pope Francis? Simple question. What is my hope? Well, I'm always full of hope. I mean, I've never not been with hope about the church. I mean, even when it's gone through its struggles, I mean, how can you not have hope when your your founder is Jesus Christ? Um, for this pontificate, yeah, I don't know. I just I, my hope is that maybe, yeah, maybe the Holy Spirit will work in a particular way now, uh, in a particular way along the lines of um, conversion, conversion, so that we can go out into the world and be missionaries of Christ to bring that gospel of Christ to all people. To um, and that and that the poor, you know, are, are truly valued and brought into. And it, it's it's not that they, it's not like that suddenly with the election of Pope Francis, the church is talking about the poor, you know, or that with liberation in the seventies, all of a sudden the church was doing something for the poor. That's a myth. The church has always, you know, done things for the poor. Um, look at the lives of the saints. But I think that maybe, you know. Somebody said already, every, the six points that I mentioned are nothing new, they're not, but, but this is what theology does, and I think this is what a pope does. He, he, he shines a light on particular aspects of the gospel, and says, here in our time, this is, what, this is maybe what we can focus on now, and it's, it's not to neglect the other aspects, but it's to say, here in our time, um, let's be people of hope, joy, and go forward. Uh, not be afraid, and it's it's a message that's in continuity with the popes who were before him. Um, he's just giving it his own kind of flavor, his own personality, and um, yeah, I just I want to see him and all the other Jesuits and all the other Catholics, Christians, and people of goodwill set the world on fire. Yeah. Amen. And set it on fire for Jesus. Thank you very much. Okay. I should maybe add, I, I'm not a father. I, I'm, I'm a religious in vows, but I'm actually not a priest. Uh, that won't be for a number of years, so, if you were wondering. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, everyone. God bless you.